Tonight, we're beyond excited to have with us Laura Lipman to launch her new essay collection, My Life as a Villainess. Laura was a reporter for 20 years, including 12 years at the Baltimore Sun. She began writing novels while working full time and published seven books about accidental PI, Tess Monahan, before leaving daily journalism in 2001. Her work has been awarded the Edgar, the Anthony, the Agatha, the Seamus, the Mira Wolf, Gumshoe, and Barry Awards. She has also been nominated for other prizes in the crime fiction field, including the Hammett and the McCavity. Joining Laura in conversation is the hero of tonight in terms of technical <laughs> fixes, Taffy Brodesser Ackner. Taffy is a staff writer at the New York Times Magazine. Prior to that, her work appeared in GQ, ESPN, the magazine, ESPN, the magazine, Matter, Details, Texas Monthly, Outside, Self, Cosmopolitan, and many other publications. She is also the author of the novel Fleischman is in Trouble, which we definitely recommend. And so without further ado, Laura and Kathy. So I am just going to start and say thank you so much for your patience. Um, if this seems haphazard, just know uh, all of these. this technical issue was uh, well earned. We, we worked very hard today to figure out this event and we are very, very sorry. Um, and so grateful that you waited in such good, in, in, such, in such good cheer. Uh, Laura, you were not here to see how people uh, just thought it was, it, they compared the weight for you with the weight for Sondheim. No, I could see all of that. Oh, you I could? could? See it. Oh, it's like being at your own funeral. You just couldn't I, even. Okay, so Laura has left the building. I have to go, go get my charger. Um, She's I was gonna a, get her charger. a woman in a glass booth of great emotion or whatever the Anchorman line is. Um, <laughs> but I just want to make sure I have a charger because I wasn't planning on doing this on my phone and my phone doesn't have enough to go until I get a charger. Okay, let me take it from here then. I am going to say, first of all, by way of introduction, you know a lot about Laura and you know a lot about her work, um, but this book just came out after a small pandemic delay and I want to tell you that my life as a villainess is a a really remarkable book of essays from somebody who who relatively recently started writing essays and who, like everything Laura does, she hacks the form and then, <laughs> and then she flies right in it. So I'm in awe of this collection. Um, they have sass, they have self, they, they, they lack the self-consciousness of somebody who is new to a form. Um, They're as confident and as beautiful as she is as a person. And they really do reflect her persona. So I know you all bought the book. I don't have to sell it to you, but I just want you to know that you're in for a remarkable um, reading experience. And I am going to ask you my first question. Is that okay? While yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I am going to say that like, you know, the thing that stuck with me through the whole book um, and reminded me how um, how recently you came to essays was the introduction in which you talk about how strange it was for you to use the first person and your journey in from a, being a reporter who was in awe of people who use the first person to then someone who realized that the people who use the first person maybe had a weakness to them to <laughs> coming around and being somebody who embraced the, th the first person enough to write this remarkable book so tell me about that journey and how you feel about i don't know other people in the room who use their first person even when even when they're doing their reporting well, I think, you know, first and foremost, I've, I've, I've gone back to my house. I've gotten my charger. And we've um, all gotten to see the Laura Lippman estate, which I think is a yes. value added, <laughs> a value added feature of this, this t terrifyingly uh, chaotic event. <laughs> oh my God. Okay. Back. I'm back here. Now it's all good. Okay. First of all, I think you've really pioneered the use of first person in feature writing. Oh, that's nice. It's really something special. And it's, the problem is you're gonna have a lot of imitators and they're not gonna do it as well. I hope not. No, <laughs> but that was also, I mean, I think in my twenties, 
And you know, part of it is being young and being immature. Part of it is having very little life experience, but just really wanting to talk about yourself. Right. Like, oh, let me tell you who I am. And let me tell you all these things that make me so special and interesting. And there are probably people in their 20s who can do that really well. I know there are, but I wasn't one of them. Mm -hmm. I didn't have anything special or interesting about me. I needed to be a reporter. I needed to be outside of myself. I needed to understand that it wasn't all the little precious words, the beautiful, beautiful words that you could put together, that it was really about the information, about what you were saying. What did you have to share? What would be right. of interest? And so, yeah, so after thinking, I, I mean, I, I couldn't even write novels in the first person. Right. And then um, you know, then finally, you know, I found that voice. And I'm thinking this through. I've actually written very little fiction in the first person. And the most first person voice I probably ever used, strangely and in a kind of charged way right now is in my last novel. The first person voice is it's a, a black, black woman. woman. Yeah. I know that you were so worried about that and it yeah. was a huge risk you felt. But I also felt like she deserved to own the book starting and leaving. So I think it's, I have never thought about it before this moment, but it's interesting to me that it begins that way where I'm writing lady in the lake. And I think I'm going to start trying to write personal essays. You know, it began as a marketing ploy. It was like, oh, I should write some essays and, and, and appear in some places where I'm not reaching some readers. Like, I need to find those readers who think they don't read crime novels because I think they would like my crime novels. Right. And, you know, you know, Taffy, because you were someone who would work pitches with me and talk to me about what a first-person piece really has to be. It has to be a, duh, it has to be about something. Right. And it has to be about something that's actually not exactly what you think it's about. Like you start out with this idea and then you go deeper. I think you did that. Didn't you write a piece about watching 30 something? Yes, I did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You wrote this piece about 30 something and the insight that gave you into your own family yeah. and the times we were living in. And, you know, I think this is all, I mean, I have a track record for loving to arrive at a form when it's been proclaimed dead. <laughs> Yay, the female private eye novel is dead. Perfect time to try it. You know, I, mean, I find that people only proclaim things are dead when the men have not figured out a way to do them in a new way. I, like, I was just asked to participate in a, is the novel dead debate? And I was like, Again? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just like, I can't cause I'm on deadline for my novel. <laughs> what are you saying? Yeah. It's, um, I, yeah, that thing I, I always remember. I was actually, when I was a reporter, Martin Amos said to me, they've been proclaiming the novel dead since Don Quixote. And the next day it's sitting up back in bed saying, I'm feeling better. I can take a little <laughs> broth. Yeah. I, you know, I think the personal essay in particular, and there was, I do think there was something exploitative going on with the personal essay. I do think that a lot of young women were being encouraged to write these like super shameful pieces. Right. That, w that you wouldn't write in 10 years. Right. Right. And I, you know, so I could, I would be comfortable saying, well, maybe it would be good if that kind of personal essay dies because I think it was very uninterested in the writer and it really was, sort of in that part Delicious. of, yeah, it was about clicks. It was about, you know, can we get people to confess to their most shameful things and then we'll get lots of clicks and we'll get some buzz and who cares what happens to the woman who went viral because she writes about, was there not literally a piece about someone finding cat hair in her vagina? I feel like I that. mean, or the woman who slept with her father. Like there was a period of time yeah. where it felt like there were no laws anymore. 
And you would think this is going to exist forever. And I wonder if everyone realizes that, which is not to say you should have any shame no. in writing. It just should be like, it's back to the question of what is valid first person writing? Is it a confession that you want? Is it like, a sh like a Cinemax confessional where you are like, guess what I did? Guess who I did it with? Or is are you under even more pressure when you use a first person to make it as relevant and about something as possible? I think that, the, okay, so I've in, in journalism, when you talk about investigative reporting, they used to talk about how Philadelphia, the Philadelphia Inquirer had this crack Jack team, Bartlett and Steele. And Bartlett and Steele would be like, we're just gonna pick a topic so big, it will yield a story. So we'll write about the tax code. Cause you write about the tax code, you're gonna find a story there. So I think that's been more or less my take with the personal essay is I'm gonna write about things that are so big in general, there's gotta be something to say. There's right. something to say about- And then things. you're not the biggest part of it. Yeah. You're just using your journalism skills for it. It's like, well, I'm an old mom. So what do I want to say about being an old mom? Menopause. What do I want to say about menopause? Right. Uh, what do I want to say about what it's like to see someone that you kind of know die and see strangers mourning that person? Right. Um, what's it like to be married to someone who creates a cultural phenomenon or to be close to a cultural phenomenon that you're just watching as a bystander. Right. I mean, I think all of those were pretty big topics. You know, there, there were sort of like, you, what's it like to be a shitty friend? Right. Let me, let me look into that. Right. Um, and that was really kind of the strategy. I mean, the book sort of happened by accident. I began writing these essays and my editor said, can you do a whole book of these? And then I want to interrupt you and say you didn't just do that. You, you know, the, you talked about my 30 something piece. There are pieces that when you have a novel come out, there are ways of promoting it. And one of the most valid ways is to write something. And I would like to call you out as somebody who, despite that being the call, refused to do it for free. And there's a huge issue, and it helped me, by the way, when I was promoting my book, to realize that like the the system depends on people so eager to have people um, read your book that you don't care that you're not getting paid. Meanwhile, journalism, you know, people wonder why you can't uh, read it half the magazines you wanted to read because they're all gone and it's because of that. So you didn't just have the confidence to 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 promote your books with these essays that you started writing. You had the confidence to say, and you must pay me for them, which is anyone watching is harder to do than it's now. <laughs> I mean that that's just my dad. That's my I'm my father's daughter. My dad hated to write for free. Right. Hated it. And he just he couldn't conceive of it. I mean he didn't care how much money he got, but you better pay him something. Right. And so I was kind of raised in that idea, but it was also, it was like, well, if this is the marketing plan, if this is the marketing plan, you need to get into the best real estate. Like you need the big billboard. Yeah. And those are the places that tend to pay. And it just seemed to me, well, this is what I'm going to try to do. You know, I'm going to try to get into the New York times. I'm going to try to get it. You know, you helped me get into real simple. Um, long reads, you know, I just DM'd Sari Botten out of the blue. I was like, you've got a section about being old. I have a lot of things to say about being old. And were you surprised that people were eager to publish you? Yes. You were, that's crazy to me because you're a famous novelist. I don't, I don't feel that way. Um, and there, you know, there are people that I would pitch who wouldn't even respond to me. Um, David Remnick of the New York. <laughs> I mean, that guy. <laughs> Who I've met face to face. It's like I like stood up a note and like I don't get a note back. It's like, okay, that's okay. Um, Laura, you are receiving a request. Is there a way for you to put oh, yeah, it's I'm, cable? Because we're all getting a little seasick with um, the moving. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Because I'm holding a phone. But I'll Is there any way to prop it somewhere? Not really. Okay. 
be stiller. Okay, you'll be stiller. And just while I'll take this interruption to just let everyone know that don't worry, this will be extended for the full hour. You nobody is robbed of uh so don't get nervous if question and answers don't start soon. Just know we are giving you and we're so sorry for the amount of time it's taking. Uh <laughs> but where are we going? <laughs> so go on, go on. You were talking. Um well, I don't remember, you know, it's just the idea of pitching and the point is, as a novelist, you want more readers always. Yeah. And I felt that, sure, I can write for Crime Hub, you know, which I love, Crime Reads. There are but lots everyone who's reading Crime Reads already knows who you are. If, they're, if they don't, then I'm pretty lost. I've got a bigger problem. And I wanted to try, you know, I wanted to try something different. I wanted, I'm always trying to do different things, even within crime fiction from book to book. I'm trying to do different things. So it's, but you know, the thing is like right now, right now I have no desire to write any personal essays whatsoever. Why not? You know, I think part of it is that I wrote a lot in yeah. just a couple of years. And I said a lot and I exposed a lot and it it takes a while to think about what would I really want to reveal now. I'm definitely someone who doesn't believe that being authentic being honest means telling everything. I don't feel obligated to tell everything. And I don't think any writer should, but I think especially female writers should be okay with having some boundaries and be like, I'm not going to talk about that. And I think that comes pretty naturally because I do have a young kid and we've always been really protective of her. They've always, it's always been a very calculated formula of how much do we say about our daughter and how much of that gets into public. And, you know, so I think I already had that mindset of, I don't have to tell everybody everything. Right. I also don't really fundamentally believe that using a first person or having it, even though your essays convey a lot of information, um, w you know, the essay that caused the, the thing I wrote that caused us to meet in the first place, I wrote a story about Weight Watchers um, and I, and Laura reached out to me and it, it is a bit, it's a, it was supposed to be a business story that devolved into a story about me and my body and my issues with my body. And Laura reached out to me and said, you don't know me, but, and I said, of course I know you. Um, and also I follow you on Twitter. I thought we were already friends, um, but I don't feel like I revealed that much in, in the first person. I think it's just the first person that I bring to things. And I think this is the same for you is as much first person as you need to understand what I'm trying to say. Yes, and I think also, it, I, it's always been there. It's always been there in a lot of the best journalism. And I think it's noticed more when women do it. Right. You know, I think men have over and over again written first person pieces and there's no worry that they're revealing too much or they're telling too much or that they don't belong in the story. Like I, I, I think that's less often a criticism heard when men use the first person. I mean, they're being Hemingway when they, when they're the, when they use the first person, they, yeah. they, they're, they've just come in from hunting and, <laughs> and we're so lucky to hear from them. <laughs> But then conversely, then as a, a woman trying to do this, you think, how can I be taken seriously? And it's just not, it doesn't feel like using the first person is a way to be taken seriously. I just, I don't think I'm skilled enough to convey 
everything unless I make it personal, unless I say, here's what it's like to be listening to these jackasses at Weight Watchers tell me that I, you know, that I lack discipline or here's what it's like for you to be an older mom at the school. Here's what it's like. I mean, it. I think of you as like a beloved sunny creature. And to hear that you are not loved by the other moms at school made me feel so much better. Oh gosh. I mean, I quite a few of the moms at my school. Yes, I love them and they love me. But no, there was definitely, you know, there were definitely. Well, you're just saying that in case some of them are here. The truth is, you're either one of the you're either one of them or you're not. And I, I mean, I think that um I you know it gets to a point where you realize you're not gonna win anyway. Like there's always going to be someone ready to discredit you for something. Right. And it, I think when you're a woman that feels especially true, uh, you know, it's either going to be you write too much about yourself, you use the first person too much, or you're tough as nails, you're just like one of the guys and that's not good enough either. And there are about, there are dozens and dozens of ways to be found wanting. Like you had a kid, you didn't have a kid, you know, all you of You didn't have stuff. enough kids. Yeah. And um, I just, at some point you just get old enough that you, you're like, fuck it. I don't care anymore. Right. Um, and I think that was actually a big part of where I ended up, which was I just didn't care anymore. And I think that was interestingly the benefit of internet trolls. Huh. Do you that get a was, lot of trolls? I don't. I don't, but it's because of how I have my filter set. Oh. Like I've Wait, done. <laughs> But every now and then I hear from them and it just made me realize there would always be someone willing to tell me that I was wrong, that I was inappropriate, that I was loud. But the biggest complaint I think I've noticed, and maybe you've gotten it too, is I, I think too well of myself. Right, right. Like that's the real crime is that I'm actually pretty confident and assured in what I do. And that's maddening. To, I, I know that there was something, I feel like it was in your Gwyneth Paltrow piece right. where men were writing you to that think that they, they thought they'd found a mistake. There are a lot. Yes. I wrote a piece. I wrote a thing. I mean, the whole thing about that's like that people are shocked about is the way a woman, I, as a woman have insisted on taking up space in those stories by even just making a Gwyneth Paltrow story 9,000 words. That is taking away space from one of the one of my male colleagues who is writing about, you know, the important fire of the thing that they're writing. But yeah, I I get a lot of nice job as if I'm looking for approval, but you have this typo, which isn't the typo. Right. It's like not by any means a typo. And I mean, when I was on my book tour, I had people who like know me, men write to me the next day and tell me that I should speak with a little bit more cadence and not recognizing themselves as the villains in the kind of global story of, no, that's not what you say to a woman. <laughs> um, Here's my question for you then. What, you call yourself a villainess. And I do, th I, I, I have to tell you that in the moments where you say things in your book, you like your face. Um, uh, Cla Claire's asking me about cadence here. What they're talking about is my upspeak or my vocal fry or all the ways that I'm Jewish without actually saying it. Any way that I'm a woman or that I'm Jewish is how I'm criticized. Um, but you talk about how you like your face. You talk about how happy you are with certain aspects of your body and your life. 
And it is like, I had to read those things twice. It's like science fiction, a woman saying those things and committing them to print and not just whispering something, uh, something to each other. And I think that, um, I wonder, is that what you think makes you a villain? Is that what make, is that like, like, what is it about that? Like, is it your, is it your insistence on not hanging out with the rest of the women who will say, oh no, my, look at my face, look at my nose, look at my chin, look at my, you know, like, like tearing each other apart. What makes you a villain according to you? Well, I mean, you know, the title essay came from a piece that had never been published before about um, when I divorced my first husband 20 years ago and I was kind of ruthless. Right. And I realized that if he told a story in his version of the story, I would be a villainous. And I was like, I'm okay with that. Um, I'm okay being the villainous in someone else's story if I think I was doing the right thing. And so there's a certain archness to it, although it did lead me in this collection to explore places in which I thought I'd been transgressive. Hmm. But yeah, I think there is something to telling people, but women in particular, to just go ahead and say it. Yeah. Say what you've been... And one of the things I've been teaching writing for a long time now, um, since 2006, I've taught once a year at a writer's workshop in St. Petersburg, Florida that was set up at Eckerd College, which is the um, alma mater of Dennis Lehane. And he created this writing workshop. We have some Eckerd people in the house. Yay, Eckerd people. Well, if they were my students, they heard me say, look, you're going to have to tell one other sentient human being what your ambitions really are. If you have to get drunk, get drunk to do it. I did. And you're going to sit there with another human being and you're going to say, I am going to, and you're going to fill in the blank. You can say, I'm going to be a New York times bestseller. You can say, I'm going to be long listed for the national book award as Taffy was for her first novel, which was amazing. And so deserved. You can say, I'm going to win the Nobel Prize. You can say, I'm going to make $10 million. I don't care what it is. I mean, it's your dream, your ambition. But if you can't say that out loud, how are you going to do it? How are you ever going to begin to have a chance to do something that you won't admit to another person? Right. So a lot of this begins there. And, you know, I wrote you about your Weight Watchers piece because I had been struggling with so many of the same issues for so long about body positivity. And then, you know, I wrote you again. I don't identify you in the essay, but you know it's you. When I got that email from Weight, Weight, Weight Watchers that we're not Weight Watchers anymore, we're Wellness That Works. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> right. I'm so angry. I get it now. I'm so pissed off. And it's like, fuck it. Fuck. I mean, you know, one of the weird things about human existence is that you actually could decide right now, this minute, that you're going to be a happy person. No matter, I mean, yeah, we're in the middle of a pandemic. There's a lot of things to be worried about. There's a lot of things to be angry about, nervous about, scared about. There are all these things, and that's those are reasonable responses. But even with all of that, you can say, I will feel all those things. I will accept those things. But I also think I could be happy. And you can definitely just sort of wake up one morning and say, I think I could be happy in my own skin. What would that feel like? What if I just decide I'm happy in my own skin and I'm just going to reject all the stuff that people say and all of these standards that people have. Um, and I think one thing that's really interesting is to sort of look for, I mean, you expect the people you're opposed to, the people who don't believe the same way as you do, to say mean, hateful things. But what's interesting is to sort of start paying attention where your allies say mean, hateful things. Right. There's a lot of ageism in our culture, a lot. Oh my gosh. Like, you know, if you open up your ears to it, you will find no shortage of otherwise, you know, well-intentioned people willing to say that old women are disgusting. It's just disgusting. Oh my God. Like, old yeah. women. And, um, yeah. you know, it's like, okay, I, I've decided I don't agree with you. 
I'm not, I'm not going to go there with you. Um, and it becomes a great exercise. And, you know, and I'm raising a girl. I, I want to raise a girl who feels great about herself. I've wanted that. I, I guess I just, I love all of that in theory. And then I look at like, you know, I feel that there is this kind of uh, interception, intersection of success and feeling too good about yourself where where other women have to take you down. Like I look at all of the kind of cancellations of, you know, like the thing that happened with Alison Roman, the thing that like, I think of all of those things. And I think they happen at this very specific time where a person becomes a certain amount successful. And then the thing that made them successful is no, it, whatever it is, whatever we can find is no longer acceptable because we somehow have to represent everybody while we're just trying to survive our own human experience, right? Yeah, I yes. I do think there is this constant desire to tear people down. And I, I've said to people, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, and I'll say it here in a public forum, I've been writing novels for a very long time. I've enjoyed a nice amount of success with it. When you do something new, that's the perfect time for people to tear you down because you yeah. dare to do something new. How dare you? How dare you? And so I've, you know, sort of put on my metaphorical armor and I'm ready for people to tell me that I suck at this or who do I think I am or why do I think these things matter or who needed to hear from me anyway. And, and, or there's a typo in your book or there's a typo in your book or yeah, all of that. And I'm kind of ready for it. I'm, I think in some ways I'm always ready for that. I'm always I'm, I'm always ready to be patronized and talked down to. Yeah. Because it's happened so much, you know, it, it happens a lot. I mean, I've made this joke over and over again so many times over the past 10, 15 years is that um, much older men, like men in their 80s, really have this big love hate thing with me because um, they really want. They like, they see someone like me, they see this woman who's not, you know, not really their daughter's age, maybe a teeny bit older. And I've got these really good biceps and like, there's a woman who, if I married her, I wouldn't have to pay for a nurse. She could lift me on or off the toilet as needed. And, and, you know, and then they're like mad at me because I don't actually want the job. I don't want the gig. Yeah. <laughs> They're so mean to me. I know. Oh my gosh. Cry also, crime. I mean, you're all. Yes. Um, someone in the questions wanted to know what do you, how do you respond to the people who say horrible things? Um, for the most part, well, it changes, and it's changed over the years. When people write me really nasty notes about my novels, I will generally, you know, if they've taken the time to email me, I will generally write back, I'm sorry you were disappointed. Right. Now, what else can I say? I'm sorry you were disappointed. One person wrote me an email about one of my books in which it was one of the books in the series that I write about Tess Monahan, and she had a daughter at the time who was about three years old. And the reader said, what a terrible brat that kid was. And I really hated her. And I hope she's not in future books. And it's like, oh my God, it's based on my daughter. <laughs> but what I wrote back and said, I, I wrote back and I said, I can understand that you found her irritating, but it's a snapshot. And there are times in our lives when our kids are irritating. Right. It wouldn't be that interesting to write a book about the time when the kid was being great. Right. Um, I try to, if there's room to have a conversation, I'll try to have it. You know, if someone comes at me with, you know, you're old, you're ugly, you're fat, and I've gotten all of that, I, I'm not going to respond to that. Um, one time there were people on Twitter who decided to launch an investigation into whether or not 
I was truly a native of the South, as I had said on Twitter in a discussion. On like Twitter. birtherism? Yeah, they thought I was lying about it because they didn't believe that you could be Jewish and from the South. They were a little bit confused about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can be. I was actually... It so happens here in the Presbyterian, but yeah, my paternal grandfather, um, Isidore Lippmann, ended up in Montgomery, Alabama, where he ran a grocery store and where my- We're everywhere. Was. Sorry guys, but we are right. everywhere. Yeah, so stuff like that. I think I just stayed out of that discussion because that's a hard one to win. But I don't know, what do you do? What are you doing? I got tagged yeah. in someone, I got tagged someone saying, um, what? I don't understand the hype over this book. Is anyone as, and as she tagged me, a Taffy Ackner's book. I, is anyone as disappointed? Can anyone tell me why so many people seem to like it? And I was so shocked that you would tag me that I wrote back and I said, I, you tagged me, so I get, I'm going to answer. And I guess the answer is that not everybody loves every book, but it's okay. And if you need any recommendations, I'm very happy to help. Hey, how, and, how, how was it to go back and write that short story? That was amazing. It was amazing to write that short story. It was amazing to ha to like return to something, to find, to, to, uh, to return to something that didn't even feel like a gimmick. Like it felt like something I really wanted to do. Like I wrote this doctor character and and now we're in a pandemic and what is he doing? He's probably really frustrated that he can't have sex and he can't, um, and he's been relegated to a different hospital. I, I loved it, but it felt like a real risk also. It felt like you have this, uh, you know, with with every, every magazine story I write, I have to pretend I never wrote a magazine story before um, because if you become self-referential or you, you, remember too much people liking or hating something you shouldn't bad writing is when you adjust for those things i think um so i i was uncomfortable doing it and then i wrote it the day after i handed in my new novel to my editor oh my god five thousand words and i was like oh it feels like writing a tweet it feels like a whisper <laughs> Um, I have one more question for you. I mean, I love this talk about ambition. Um, oh, someone wants to know where the story is published. Is it stuff on the cut? You could find it's called Fleischman is in lockdown, Ellen. Um, and if you follow Taffy on Twitter, it's her pinned tweet right now. It's my pin. Thank you, Laura. <laughs> um, we're talking, you know, I have two last questions because I love how much, and people seem to like that we're talking about ambition. Um, you have recently, thank you, this, thank you, Sabir, for putting that in. Um, you have recently um, started winning a lot of awards that you, based on our discussions, had come to peace with not having won. Um, what does that do when you decide that you are fine, you have a successful career, these awards don't mean anything. And then one day you win one and you realize, uh-oh, <laughs> winning awards is wonderful. Like, where do you now put that? And ha have things changed for you? So um, it's actually embarrassing how many awards I've won in crime fiction and it's been off and on over the years. But, and when I got- When I the Edgar, you were- I always want to win. I always want to win. I'm always I like, I, I would like to win. I think I'm the best one, usually. And we're such competitive bitches for I know, one award. I, mm. I am really, really competitive. Mm. But, you know, something's happened this year. If, if we don't get some perspective, God help us. I feel like I just have the exact right amount of perspective right now, which is I really celebrate the positive stuff. Right. And the negative stuff is really rolling off of me. Mm -hmm. And I don't worry about it. But like anything that comes along that's positive, I'm like, yay, that's nice. And I feel good about it. Um, it doesn't it doesn't have power over me anymore. It's not, I, I think that what happened was is several years ago, I'd come through a bad time and I felt like um, professional success would be my reward for coming through a bad time. 
and it didn't happen. It's like, what? So I think that kind of got me over the idea that there's some sort of quid pro quo with the universe. There's not. It's not. And, um, but yeah, the whole, you know, first of all, I will say this. I actually think ambition is one of the rare words that's negative no matter what gender it's applied to. Maybe it's more negative with women. But even if you say of a guy he's ambitious, you're not saying something nice about him. I think you are. I think, oh, look at him. He's ambitious. And like, look at her. He's ambitious. Yeah. It's, it's, well, it's worse for a woman, but I still don't think it's that positive for a guy. I think there's something... I think there's some American love of the idea of being successful by accident. And it's just happening to you. It's just Look happening. how discovered I am. So good, you can't make it stop. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's generally a criticism, but it's like, I don't understand it. Why wouldn't you be ambitious? And if I'm not going to be ambitious for myself, who's going to be? No one else is. No one else, you know, really cares about what you're doing. So, yeah, I'm, I'm really comfortable with being super ambitious. So the one I have the question I have for you is I thought we were going to out ourselves as the members of that secret writing club. Let's do it. Let's do it. One, two, three. (laughs) We're fast writers. Laura and I have forged like, and please do not tweet this. uh, Ellen, Ellen is live tweeting us here. Um, We are fast writers and you're, and like the fact that we keep that a secret, even though we are coming out tonight, um, the fact that we keep that a secret is a really interesting aspect of the ambition conversation and the talent conversation, because you have to like the algorithm of success is you have to have suffered for it. And I have always felt like I, I don't know how you feel. You talk about your age a lot. Like, I wonder if you feel like people are, are better with things now that you're older. I think I, I always thought that my chubbiness was a mitigating factor in people thinking of me as, as like, like, Oh, at least she's, you know, or at least she, I, I don't know what it is. I just think I'm a fast writer because, because I'm so ambitious. I've outed myself, guys. Thank to you. me, it's just a kind of writer metabolism. I write fast. It's how I, I also read slowly, and I write fast because I can't concentrate if I'm not writing fast. Yeah, is that just, how it is for you? It's just a natural rhythm. It's like, you know, are you an ectomorph? Are you a mesomorph? What is it? I don't know what those how, words mean. It has to do with your body. You're like skeleton. You're like, you know, your shape you're born with it. And I, I feel like I was born with a, a predisposition toward speed, which people have always been trying to shame me about. Like, if you do it that fast, how good could it be? Right. And the fact of the matter is, it's almost like I'd like to be able to like put a Fitbit on most of the writers I know that could somehow measure the mental energy they put out each day, because I don't think the slow writers are working that much harder. I just think they're working a lot more slowly. But it is a risk that it is a risk to say, you know, I have a book coming out in June and if it were coming out in three years, I think people, if it's bad, people will be like, ah, you tried. But if it's bad, people will think I'm arrogant for having a book come out two years after my first book instead of like 12 years. I just, I know it's such a baffling concept to me though that the that we I, I just don't even get it i i feel like this idea I, but there's a lot of stuff and i you know went off on this about twitter earlier this week a lot of our notions about success and ambition are really patriarchal and this model of the hermit creator yeah who either doesn't have family or ignores family and that the that the best art is produced in isolation in which we sort of are you know neglecting and ignoring everyone around us that's a terrible model it is a but terrible model and i wonder why it gets around i wrote my book in the nordstrom bathroom that has a couch at the mall near me um and 
like it's 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 incredibly unglamorous. Someone wanted to say someone asks here, do we think that starting in journalism helped us be fast? And I'm gonna say that a lot of people like to say that, oh, you're a deadline journalist. I say no, because I think it's because I was a woman in a man's space, and I felt that my value was that while all of these tortured men were torturing and, hand and handing their stories in three weeks late, my competitive edge was that I was gonna have, I was gonna write a good story and it was going to be on time and I was not gonna be tortured. And then I also wonder if so few women ahead of us have been comparatively, have been given a chance that we are not having a constant jousting war with all the geniuses that have come ahead of us and that we stand the chance of doing something new. Maybe that's why the novel is dead, according to men, because men haven't done anything new with it in a while, although that's not true either. Um, so so that's what I think. I think that like, there's that like, you know, there's this idea that like, you're a hack if you're writing too quickly. And that I think that makes us have to be better at it, right? I mean, I just, yeah, I'm, I'm. I mean, I came out of the. I came out today, and I announced that I was a fast writer. You know, I was feeling guilty. We support you. Thank you. It took me. I was sitting around feeling really bad about myself because I needed 16 months to write my latest novel, and I was like, okay, wait a minute. I wrote the novel in 16 months. I also wrote an entire book of essays in that 16 months. Right. And I wrote two short stories, and I did this all while being a mom, running a household. And I'm sorry, I just am proud of that. No you one's going to convince me that the fact that I found time to bake peanut butter and chocolate chip cookies for my kids' bake sale, that my book suffered for it. Right. Um, one of the most interesting things for me was that, you know, the pandemic rolled in and life changed. And my daughter was doing distance learning, which meant she could sleep until like eight. And then like she'd get up and start school about nine, a little bit later than usual. So I found myself coming full circle from when I had a full-time job. And I used to get up at six in the morning and write until it was time to go to work. I started getting up at five in the morning and I had most of my work done by the time my daughter got up at eight. And that was the best way to do it. And it wasn't so bad. I mean, other than the fact that I fell asleep at nine o'clock in the evening, but, you know, it's, I, I just won't support this idea that, you know, if you're fast, you're lesser, if you it, know, has, it has nothing to do with it, it's if just your work lovely. is accessible, it's lesser. It's like, it's, it's like, yeah, I'm not buying into the whole tortured artist. I'm just not. Let's not. Jen Cheney, who is an incredible TV critic, is here, and I love her. And she is asking um, if the pandemic has slowed either of us down. Um, it sounds like it didn't to you. It didn't to me, except that, um, you know, I wrote a, a novel about a wealthy family on Long Island, and the person telling the story has a lot of issues with their wealth. And I had a lot, nothing slowed me down, except that 10 weeks before it was due, I was like, I have to do it. Um, I don't think I was slower, but I do think that I had a lot of moments of, is the, the world is in flames, who is going to read this? And I have to just assume someone will. And I, I already sold the book. I have like, you know, I don't, I have to give the money back if that, you yeah. know, like I can't do that. I've already spent the money. So what's your answer to it? Um, look, it hasn't slowed me down. It has led me to a place, and this also might be my age and a lot of other things, but I'm saying no a lot more. I'm yeah. like, you know what? I don't need to work quite as much. I, I said no mm -hmm. to a really good opportunity to write a long narrative piece about true crime. I've just said no to a bunch of stuff. The only thing I've said yes to since I submitted my book on June 1st was I did say yes to writing an afterword to a new edition of Marjorie Morningstar, which I'm crazy about. So oh my God, that's amazing. And I turned that in on Friday. And now I find myself, my I've done my revisions. I have copy edits ahead. I have galleys ahead. And I owe one 
I, I'm gonna I'm going to write a novella that I promised to write and that's it and I I thought well it's gonna be a long time before I know what I want to write next as a novel and then last night no yeah I was like no it won't <laughs> talk talking to my husband after dinner about just about the the very real problem of when I do write a novel will it be set in the present day or will it be set in the past you know how do I deal problem. with and I started talking about an idea that I've long had and about a part of the recent past that I'd like to write about. And I got up this morning and I got out my little journal and I just started a girl. saying, what about this? What about this? What's going on? What would be the big secret? And I just feel like the well is filling up again and I'm really you happy. About get it, it again. Good. Of course it's, it's the thing that really bothers me about this pandemic other than all the things that bother me about this pandemic um, is the way people are treating art. The amount of people who say there's not going to be any good art. Um, I saw something on Twitter, two novelists talking and saying that anyone who finishes a novel during this time is a sociopath. And I mean, oh, <laughs> whoops. Ouch. So like, I just to speak to what Jen asked before, like, this is very hard. And the way I've grappled with how hard it is, is by, is by holding on to the one thing that might lead to something normal after. Like it can't all be doom scrolling. It can't all be calling and checking in on people. It can't all be small talk. I mean, the, uh, the small talk we are having lately, how are you? Is everyone fine? Is everyone like, I can't, there has to be something in it. And once you run through all the good TV, it turns out there isn't, we were so worried there was too much TV. There isn't no, <laughs> not there's not TV. enough TV. There's not enough TV. I'm going to be rewatching some stuff pretty soon. Um, I was going to ask this one last question and then we're going to get exactly into these nice people's questions um, that we're a half hour late to. I'm going to ask, um, on a, like a kind of a beautiful note, what during, when the pandemic started, you made a very big to do about getting dressed in the morning <laughs> and you would, and this was a question some people had like, um, you know, the act of getting dressed, the telling of the story. I'd like to know what that did for you, but you have to tell me briefly because we have to get to these people's questions. And I would like, and someone in this um, question answer uh, module would like to know which was your favorite um, outfit. Um, I think my favorite outfit was when it was 39 degrees in May and I was wearing a plaid coat and a pink wig. <laughs> That's <laughs> I when I started worrying. 39 degrees I was starting to worry after. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, it was, it was interesting because it was counterintuitive. I mean, but yeah. before, before the pandemic, I spent all of my time in sweats. So for <laughs> me, it was novelty. And I was like, you know, there's something about this that feels good. I mean, I think the biggest thing about the pandemic is it changed my relationship with time. I thought there was never enough time, and it turned out there was always enough time. What were was we just doing traveling an hour to lunch? Yeah. There was time to brush my hair and put on nice clothes and, you know, darken my eyebrows if they needed it. And so, I mean, I still actually, I, I stopped taking the photos as I always intended to when my book was done, but I am still pretty good about putting Getting on good. nice Show clothes. Your shoes. Right you had asked about, you had threatened to ask us about shoes. Are you wearing nice shoes right now? They're not that nice because it was raining out and I had to go out. I would, you know, I would stick my leg up, but they're pretty basic. But I, I had planned to wear some really nice shoes, but they were suede and I had to go out in the rain, so I couldn't wear them. There you go. So. Okay, so here's some here's some questions that are lightning roundy that okay. I would like you to answer. And if, it, if any of them um, call for more sub substance, I just want to get a lot of people um, like all of, like, like someone who is beloved, people want to know the things inside your head a little bit. And I want to make sure all of these are answered. Um, um, which is your favorite book that you have written? Okay, I'm going to take the cheap route out and say it's the picture book, Liza Jane and the Dragon, because it was inspired by my daughter. 
Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. What's your favorite novel? Um, you know, to date, I will say that I have a particular fondness for a book called After I'm Gone, oh. which, is about, um, which is really about the lives of several women and how they're shaped by the disappearance of, well, he's the father to three of them, the husband to one, and the boyfriend to another. And how those five women cope when he disappears is it's came out in 2014 and it's one of, it's probably my favorite. That's amazing. Okay. Um, I love that book. And someone in the chat is saying that her one Liz is saying her, her one year old niece loves Liza Jane. Um, what, what are your favorite news sources? Where are you going um, for news? Well, I do subscribe to the New York Times. I get a I get a real newspaper on my doorstep every morning. We thank I you. A, I get a digital version of the Baltimore Sun, and I get a digital version of the Los Angeles Times, and I can't remember why. I have a physical subscription to the New Republic, and then I read a lot of stuff online. Um, I'll read Vanity Fair online. I don't consider that a news source per se. Um, very interested in ProPublica. You know, i a huge fan of the work of Pamela Koloff, who writes for numerous, you know, I think she's at... Um, she's she, at ProPublica and New York Times Magazine. Yeah. She's in the partnership. And where else do... You know, it's, Twitter is a really good resource for finding I, know. I wouldn't other find. So I read a lot of things that I find on Twitter. Um, you know, I get the New York Times... Uh, the New York Review of Books. Mm -hmm. I get... It, it goes on and on and on. You know, I'm kind of blanking on, and you know, I, you know, I get like Bon Appetit and various travel magazines, which seems like a real fantasy right now. I know. Yeah, news or travel magazines. Yeah, news sources mainly pretty mainstream. Washington Post. I also have a subscription to the Washington Post. That's digital. Yeah. Um, I feel pretty well covered. Okay, that's good. I think those are some some good some good tips. Um, as as a, as a um, Addie would like to know, as a journalist, how do we both make our subjects feel comfortable? You go first, although it's been a while since you've done a straight up interview, right? That sounds right. Um, I mean, my standard for how to get a good interview was just to try to spend as much time with the person as possible, because I would say about at the two hour mark, people's ability to um, maintain a fake front begins to flag. And yeah. as a person who is somehow profiled, I never like to spend more than an hour with someone because yeah, now, you know, like, no, at, at hour two. So how did you do it, Taffy? Um, I do it by not pretending that we are ever going to be comfortable with this completely weird, fatuous setup. And that seems to work. It seems to work to not try to pretend that this isn't what it is and to speak very frankly with somebody. And also a thing I do is I don't ask many questions until much, much later. Um, and putting the onus on someone else to speak gives them a, um, a sense that they're in control and they are, I don't want like, I do not, like questions that are the nailing you questions the is it true that you like by the time you get to me where i am you've been interviewed so many times that i have all that information that even if things go poorly i know that i could write about how poorly they went see my bradley cooper story um i don't need you know it, it it's a confidence that you could still write a story even if the person were to fall asleep, which is how my first GQ story went, I wrote about Nicki Minaj and she fell asleep. And I wrote the story because speaking of ambition, there was no one who was gonna keep me out of GQ and it was not gonna be Nicki Minaj, no matter what. Um, I think that it's important to know that you have something to say, no matter what they say, that you can't live and die um, based on their participation so that's how I do it. Um, but mostly I do it the same way we're doing it. I've asked you way more questions than I've ever asked a celebrity though. Um, <laughs> um, this is a great question from Kate. Does your ambition ever wane? And if so, 
how do you revive it? No, it doesn't wane. It changes. And mm -hmm. it may it may be targeted at less obvious goals right now. But no, I would say it in some ways it just gets sharper. I mean, the thing about being a novelist, this is, I mean, I'm gonna throw this at you. The peak of the mountain is so far away. <laughs> You know, it's like, oh, <laughs> hi, like up there is crime and punishment. I know. I'm not going to get there. Anna Karenina, still the book of summer. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like, <laughs> hi, you know, it's like, there are these amazing novels and they're so far away that it's almost comforting. It's yeah. Like, it's just a very big mountain and I'm just going to keep climbing up it. And I'm going to, I think the key thing for me is I define ambition for myself. And I have very definite ideas. And for basically, the biggest ambition I have is to never write the same book twice. That's and good. Like, what do I have? To, what about you, though? How are you defining it? Um, ambi like, how am I dealing with? Okay, so, so the thing I was most afraid of writing my second novel is that I wrote it so quickly after the first one came out that I was, people were still talking about the first one. And so my own, it's funny. My only goal was how could I write a novel that is different, but that, that will make sense as a thing you would want to read if you read my first novel. I don't want you to get this novel and be like, oh, I like that other one. And I guess it's like what, if I were somebody who understood how to practice, practice mindfulness, <laughs> I think it would be this, that I can say, I just have to write a story that I can't wait to tell you. And I think you are doing the same thing. I think that's what happened where you said, I'm not going to write another book. And then you woke up and you did. I think that ambition is, if you listen for it, you'll always hear the call for your next thing. I really do. I think that. I think that that's the way it works with ideas. I think openness and generosity. And I think having friends who are writers um, and I think writing the thing that's hardest for you, that is the most challenging. This was a hard book to write. It's 600 pages. It's dang. Dang. Great. <laughs> and I'm very afraid that no one's going to buy it. And that I think is what keeps me. And, you know, last year I did my first, um, you know, sexual in uh, harassment investigation. Like, Doing the things that are scary to you will keep you ambitious because the high from finishing it, not even succeeding at it, but finishing it, what is life about? Like the stakes in this business are so low because of poor remuneration, because of the, like, if I want, if if it was just a numbers game, if it was just about money, I would have been a lawyer. I'm, I'm only kidding. I couldn't have gotten through law school. <laughs> yeah, that's what you mean, though? I mean, it's like I think the thing that would scare me the most is any day that I woke up and was like, "Yeah, I've got this. This is easy." Like at the moment, I start saying to myself, "This is easy, and I don't have to worry about it." I would be terrified because then I would know I would be doing a really crappy job. Right. Right. Or that like I did something that wasn't that was easy, like that's not what I'm in it for. You know, Jonathan Franzen once told me when I interviewed Jonathan Franzen, he said, I don't write. I'm not writing a book because I want to get through this year and have a book come out. I'm writing a book because I want that year. And sometimes and it didn't make sense to me at the time because I hadn't yet finished my first book. But I think about that interview a lot. And when I am figuring something out, I, re I realize that's what he was talking about. That it is wild that you could just make shit up and people want to hear it. That's wild. Especially as a journalist, wild. 
It's great. It's great. I, it's so, this is so much easier <laughs> than writing a magazine story. I have oh, to yeah. tell you. Oh yeah. All right. Um, I'm going to finish with a very essential question. I hope you do not feel um, unprepared, but Erin would like to know what lipsticks we are wearing. Oh, oh gosh. I'm wearing a Bobbi Brown that's pretty dark, although I think I chewed a lot of it off and the anxiety over the time. I mean, this was not an easy launch here. <laughs> Nothing. I mean, ambition. <laughs> That's right. What are you wearing? What's your lipstick? I am. Thank you for asking. I am wearing a my book tour lipstick, which is um, which is a uh, it's called the color is fiery. Wait, j talk for a second. I'm just gonna get it because well, I do I, think this is an important. What I would say is that my it's unusual that I'm wearing a Bobbi Brown lipstick tonight. Most of the lipsticks I wear are Burt's Bees from the drugstore, which I think are wonderful. And very okay. underrated. I, you know, okay. <laughs> Here's where we are. It's Stila. It's Stila um, Stay All Day Liquid Lipstick. However, it has not even stayed through this conversation. And also the problem with it is look, like there's like... <laughs> um, I wanna thank you, Laura, for writing this book, for being such a wonderful sort of mentor in the world for being someone who is so easy to love and admire. I think this book is terrific and I wish you the best of luck with it. And I also want to thank everybody here. I don't know if you saw the love fest in the chat area. I but did. I did. I there are a couple of people who no were talking to Dennis Lehane and I don't blame them. I wish, I wish for you that I was a in the audience of your Dennis Lehane conversation. I hope I did an okay job, but I, I want you also to know how much, like what a good crowd you bring in of nice people who are saying thoughtful and nice things. And they were also incredibly patient. Thank and you uh, we uh, at the Strand, I know Severe at the Strand is very grateful. Ooh, I just found out that I'm wearing the same as AOC. Um, and Taffy, thank you for this. Thank you for the conversation. And you've been a mentor and supported me in so many ways as well. And I never lose sight of that. Oh, I love you. I love you too. For you, I put on a shirt. <laughs> <laughs> wow, thank you. Uh, I won't say I wore a real bra, but I wore the sports bra with the underwire in it. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Laura, and thank you so much, Taffy. That conversation was amazing. And then I just want to echo my thanks to everyone for being so patient. If there are any upcoming events you'd like to see at The Strand, which are ticketed, send me an email at severe at strandbooks.com, which I will drop in the chat as we're talking, and I am happy to comp you entry. Again, thank you so much, and thank you for an awesome conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.